going back home, Tina near to the land of the beautiful queens. I'm going back home to my baby. I'm going back to New Orleans. Gonna see the name, my parent, cousin, and my mom and pa. Gonna plant my feet on Grandpa Street and be there for the Mardi Gras. I've been to Cuba, South America way. I've been to Euro, Mexico is okay. Over in France, the chicks are really fine. I give my kicks below the Mason Dixon line. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, at my Aunt Julia's house, which my parents were staying at down in the 8th Ward, very close to the 7th Ward, where all the famous Creole musicians came from, like uh, Jelly Roll Martin. We the same color. Anyway, I was born uh, in 1941, June 23rd. I went to Corpus Christi Elementary School and from there, I won a four-year academic scholarship to attend St. Augustine High School and uh, the Purple Knights. And uh, after that, I went to uh, University of New Orleans for a brief period, and then I got married. <laughs> but after, you know, uh, I got divorced. <laughs> I went back to school and finished, and I got a degree in business administration from Southern University in New Orleans. My mother said of all her children, I cried the loudest. See, I could hear him crying all around the corner. She knew I was going to be a singer. And to solidify her belief, she adhered to a, an old Creole tradition, uh, superstition, whatever you may call it, uh, that said, if you want your child to grow up to be a singer, you have to cut his nails under a fig tree. Well, fortunately, we had a fig tree in our backyard. So when I was a, uh, a young boy, uh, you know, like a child, uh, my mother, uh, cut my nails under the fig tree. My mother recognized my talent at an early age because she played the piano and she would get me to sing for all of her friends who would come over because she wanted to show me off in front of all her friends. And I was so shy, she had to make me sing. Sing! <laughs> So I would, she would play the piano and I would sing. And what really encouraged me to become a singer, one of her friends said, oh my God, what a beautiful voice. And she gave me a silver dime. <laughs> and you know, a silver dime was like a hundred dollars to me back in those days. So I said, wow, <laughs> you can get paid for this. <laughs> And so after that, you know, they couldn't shut me up because <laughs> I thought I would get money every time I sang. <laughs> but, you know, she put me in the boys' choir when I was in elementary school and, uh, of course, she didn't get paid for that. I uh, kind of naturally gyrated to uh, the guitar because my family is a, a family of string players. You know, my mother played the piano, my grandfather played the banjo, my older sister played the violin and the viola, so I had a natural affinity to a string instrument. Of course, I didn't know that, and there was a ukulele hanging around the house when I was a kid. I'd grab the ukulele and try to pick out little melodies on it, and then I went to the piano, and I tried to just play little melodies that I was familiar with that my mother, you know, would sing songs and all. And I just tried to be picking out the melody till I got them that are perfect. And uh, uh, what really uh, got me into the guitar was uh, when my older sisters were in high school, there were a lot of high school dances back then. And they would, uh, in order to raise money for the school, they would throw these high school 
dances and hire rhythm and blues bands to get the teenagers out to come and dance and uh, buy the tickets to raise money for the school. Well, lo and behold, my mother had so many children, she couldn't act as a chaperone. So, take your little brother John, which is, oh, we don't want to take him. Go, go with her, because I can't be a chap. So, I was the quote unquote chaperone for my older sisters when they would attend the high school dances. Uh, they went to like St. Mary's Academy, Xavier Prep, and uh, I would tag along with them, you know. But uh, when I heard those rhythm and blues band, soon as I got in there, I'd go straight up to the bandstand and just sit there the whole night looking at the guitar players because I had the unique honor and privilege of being exposed to some of the best guitar players in town that played in those rhythm and blues band. One of them was Snooks Eaglin. I saw Snooks, and man, I had never seen a blind man play the guitar, and Snook would just rail back in the chair, and he'd be playing all the Ray Charles' songs like Mary Ann, and he'd play the piano parts on the guitar, and he could play, you know, a uh, finger style, so he'd have the, the bass line and the chord changes all going at the same time, then he would sing on top of that. So, man, that just blew me away. Then I heard, uh, uh, Papoose Nelson he used to play with Fats Domino. So I was just like Justin Adams or the Adams family, the guitar players, and you know, I just uh, had this attraction to the guitar. And uh, I used to just watch these people and I said, that's what I want to be. I want to be a guitar player. <laughs> I played along with a lot of pickup bands, and one of the bands that I played with the most was a group called the Ivories, named after the piano keys. They called the Ivories on the piano. And uh, we played a lot of fraternity parties and dances and picnics and weddings, and that was a band I played most frequently with. And uh, I also played uh, with uh, one of uh, bands with some of my high school friends called the Rockettes. And this was when I was in high school. Same time that I was playing with the Irish and a lot of other groups, the Playboys. And you know, I would get called primarily as a guitar player and a singer. And uh, like say, one kiss led to another. So I kept playing with all these different bands. And uh, the band that I played with the most and made the most money with, well, the band leader, uh, he uh, took off to California to, to uh, after he got out of school, he, his family moved to California and uh, he pursued higher education and whatever reason, you know. So uh, some of the players that played with the Irish, you know, I kind of like reorganized the band and kept the name because that was the, the magic name that could get us a lot of the uh, gigs that we had been working. During that particular time in music history, most of the groups were identified by the lead singer or the band leader, and they would have a name following his name, like Sugar Boy and the Cane Cutters. Everything was an Ann, Danny White and the Cavaliers, uh, Snooks Eaglin and the Flamingos, and there was Sugar Boy and the Shapaka Shawis. Uh, uh, <laughs> and so uh, most of the bands were identified, you know, by the name of the band leader or the singer. Because the singer was the guy, you know, that people identified the band because he was on the front line all the time. So, uh, Anyway, we had one of these meetings to decide what we gonna call him looking at me. <laughs> what we gonna call him? <laughs> and everybody was throwing names in the hats, you know, let's call him Lil Red, let's call him Lil this, uh, 
little uh, uh, all kind of different names and all of a sudden the drummer Al Miller came up and said let's call him Deacon Jones everybody said yeah 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 let's call him Deacon Jones and I said Deacon Jones I said man don't call me that I said, people going to think we got a gospel group. We'll never get no gigs around here. If we cut a record, ain't nobody going to play it on the radio because they think we got a gospel group. And they just kept laughing. They said, yeah, I like that name. Yeah, Deacon Jones. But uh, the guy who tagged me with the name, he used to play with Roy Brown. And Roy Brown had that song, Good Rockin' Tonight. And there was a line in the song that said, Deacon Jones, Elder Brown, two of the slickest cats in town. They'll all be there just to wait and see, rocking in or stomping at the jamboree. I heard the news, there's good rocking tonight. <laughs> when I organized my first band, you know, well, we were very popular in the black nightclub. This was back in segregation, you gotta remember. So there were the black clubs and the white clubs. Of course, the black bands could play the white clubs and the black clubs. So uh, I became very popular in black society. And then at some point I crossed over into playing for uh, white people. But at this particular time at the Dew Drop, you know, I was primarily playing for mostly black audiences. Uh, social and pleasure dances and nightclubs and I became you know one of the popular bands around town and uh, so when you are able to draw a crowd in the club scene well everybody wants you because <laughs> you can make money for them Pinnacle of all the nightclubs back then was the Dew Drop, because the Dew Plot Drop was the showplace of the stars, and everybody who was anybody played the Dew Drop. So, uh, uh, when the word got out that we were a popular band, well, then you know we got to play at the Dew Drop, and the Dew Drop was the only place in town where there was a floor show and that's why the Dew Drop was the most popular club in town. We used to put on a little skit ourselves with Deacon John and the Iris and uh, we'd dress up in our tuxedos. We had different colored jackets for every day of the week. And uh, Anyway, uh, I was playing there one night, you know, and uh, every, I was, you know, had a reputation as a good guitar player and singer, so in walks Alan Toussaint. And you know, he used to hang out at the Dewdrop too. So did Dave Bartholomew, Huey Smith, Eddie Bull, all of the people who were uh, doing a lot of the recording sessions during those days. And so Alan Toussaint just walked up to the stage, introduced himself, and asked me would I like to uh, join him on some recording sessions. You know, man, my eyes lit up like they were on fire. <laughs> what? I said, I said, sure. <laughs> because, you know, if you were good enough to play on a recording session, well, that meant you had arrived, you know. You were like one of the mainstays, you know, of the New Orleans culture. If you could play good enough to play on a recording session. So that was like a feather in your cap as a musician you were good enough to play on recording sessions. And it also meant, you know, there was another revenue stream coming in because you got paid for the recording sessions. And you can make the gigs too because most of the recording sessions were in the daytime or they would be during the week when uh, uh, most of the gigs weren't happening like on a Monday or Tuesday, you know, that's when they would call it most of the recording sessions because most of the musicians were available. And one of the reasons, you know, that I was chosen, you know, for these recording sessions because I was available. And once you get into 
the quote unquote clique because it was a hand picked bunch of musicians that played for the majority of the recording sessions. And once you got in that number, other people would seek your services too. Yeah, let's get the one that played on Mother in Law because they thought, you know, you had the success formula uh, that if you played on this hit record, you know, you know, let's get him on this record so it'll probably be a hit if we got these kind of musicians. Uh, one of the first uh, recording sessions I participated in was Ernie Cato. You know, like uh, when I got that famous call from Alan Tucson, it was in the Dew Drops. Yeah, I like the way you play guitar and boom. The next couple of days I was in the studio with Ernie Cato's on There's a Will, There's a Way. That was one of his uh, classic recordings. You know, it wasn't a big hit like some of the other ones, but that was the first step. And, you know, I played on Mother-in-Law, Tainted the Truth, and Fortune Teller, Lipstick Traces, and uh, I played on uh, some with other producers besides Alan. There was uh, Harold Baptiste, and there was Wardell Kazan, and there was Eddie Bow and Dave Bartholomew. They all were doing recording sessions back then on the different artists that they produced. So I played on some with Ewish Smith. Uh, uh, I played on some of the, uh, the hit songs that I played on, but like Barefoot and It Ain't My Fault, It's Raining, Rule of My Heart, Hitting On Nothing, uh, Come On, Let Me Show You Where It's At, and uh, I Like It Like That, Chris Tanner, Land of a Thousand Dances, Something You Got, uh, Big Chief, Teasing You, uh, Working in the Coal Mines, Love of Love, uh, Ride Your Pony, and uh, a whole string of, I, I played on, uh, I think I could safely say like a huge percentage of the minute sessions with Alan Toussaint, I was on the majority of the, the classic rhythm and blues that came out of that period. And besides Alan Toussaint sessions, I also played uh, sessions with Edward Frank. Uh, they would come up with recording sessions with different artists that came along, Stanley Chase on with the Aubrey Twins and uh, Paul Barisco. And, you know, through the years, you know, uh, quite, quite a number of recording sessions that I played on many of the classic rhythm and blues uh, hits that came out of New Orleans during that day. I was the guitar player on that. I could call myself the ghost guitar player because the musicians who played on the sessions weren't credited like they are now. So you get a hit record and you don't know who's playing on there. All you know is that Alan Tooth ain't playing the piano, but you don't know who the rest of the musicians are. Uh, when the festival was first being organized, you know, I had one of the hot local bands around town, so I got booked on the first festival, and I've been playing uh, the jazz festival every year since it started. I'm one of the few musicians I can say that I have played for every jazz festival since they first started. Uh, I was chosen, you know, to play for every festival, and uh, the record's been unbroken even with Hurricane Katrina. Because <laughs> I was still here. After Katrina, you know, I wasn't forced to move uh, because uh, I live in a section of town that didn't get flooded. I was uh, an actor slash musician in Angel Heart when uh, it was filmed in New Orleans. Uh, of course, I tried out for the, one of the major parts, and uh, uh, the, the, the director told me, uh, well, I don't think you look right for this part. <laughs> but we have another role for you. And I played the, uh, the slide guitar in some of the scenes with Brown and McGee. There was another one I did for Miller Beer that I knew I wasn't gonna get this one. It was a blues-based commercial, and it was like uh, you had the, they had the blues mentor was one of the characters in the commercial, and there was a young guy, an aspiring young guitar player, and I was like the mentor that he looked up to. And uh, man, 
everybody auditioned for that commercial. Gate Mount Brown, Sun Pie, Danny Barker, yeah, Wolfman, oh man. And I looked around in the room and I said, oh God, I know I ain't getting this one because I know I don't look black enough to be a blues man. <laughs> and uh, I just went, you know, and I got the second call. And then uh, when I finally got selected, I started crying. I said, man, I said, well, uh, well, I didn't cry right away. I was elated, you know. And I said, man, well, out of all of these people, why did you pick me? And he said, we like your smile. And I started crying. I said, wow, sometimes it don't matter, you know. He said, we just like your smile. Well, through the years, you know, a lot of uh, musicians have uh, played in my band, you know, they've gone on to bigger and better things and established their own careers and, you know, that in many ways have surpassed, you know, my own. Uh, some of the example I can give you is like Zigaboo Motorlease with the Meters. He started out playing for me when he was in high school. And he played with uh, me, and so did uh, Art Neville, uh, James Booker. Uh, many of the musicians who played in my band have uh, gone on to bigger and better things, established their own career, made hit records like Willie T. And I could think of a whole bunch of musicians, you know, that have. Uh, went on to bigger and better things, moved to other parts and established their own career. But, you know, for me, I'm happy for them, you know, because uh, I was part of their tutelage. And they'll come back and tell me, say, man, I learned a whole lot from playing in your band, which enabled me to be more successful. My signature song, of course, is Many Rivers to Cross, and uh, it came about uh, in 1970 when I had a hard rock band, and I saw the music change, and my manager at the time was Stanley Chason, and uh, he uh, worked for a distributorship in New Orleans called All South Distributors, and so he was privy to all of the latest uh, recordings and movies that came about because he would be a distributor and he also was in charge of promoting uh, some of the uh, records. He was like the promo man and worked for a distributorship. So he was privy to a lot of uh, the newer songs that were coming out before they hit the marketplace. And he heard this song by Jimmy Cliff from the movie uh, The Harder They Come and it was Many Rivers to Cross. And he said, man, I got the perfect song for you. And he was right. Because Many Rivers to Cross became a, a regional hit. For me, it was the, the first uh, kind of hit record I had. It was going to be a hit record. It looked like it from what the sales were across the Gulf South. But of course, uh, something happened. Uh, I got covered by some major artists like Percy Sledge. Well, his rendition of Many Rivers to Cross uh, got more airplay than mine because he was an established artist with Atlantic Records, one of the biggest record companies in the world, and they had a lot of clout with the radio station, so they uh, played his version over mine. I knew it was the perfect song for me because uh, it was like the story of my life and uh, people can relate to that because it's a story of all the struggles people face in life and uh, and it looks like you know life is just a struggle every day and we continue to uh, cross more and more hurdles more and more rivers to cross as life goes on 
There's just many rivers to cross, and it seems like I can't find my way over. And wandering, I am lost. And I'm just traveling along the white cliffs of Dover. So uh, it kind of sums up, you know, my life story at the time. Well, I've been in the New Orleans uh, Musicians Union since 1958. Uh, I've been a member. I joined uh, the segregated local. There was a black union and a white union. I'm the first African-American president of the merged locals because the merger came about uh, in uh, 1968. Prior to Katrina, uh, there was a scandal involved with the, the president at the time, and our union went into quote unquote trusteeship, which meant the parent organization took over the union, got rid of all the officials, and we had to build the union back up until it was able to survive on its own. And then there was another election held after that. And just by coincidence, the next open election after trusteeship was right after Katrina. And that's when I ran for president. And I've been president ever since. Oh, I want to be remembered by future generations as the man uh, who tried to help people. You know, I've used my life as an example, you know, because what I did to help people was I did a valuable contribution. I gave them jobs. I gave a lot of musicians good jobs to help supplement their income to create a better life for themselves and their families. So and I want to remember as a guy, you know, who tried to help people. You know it's hard to love another man's girlfriend. You can't see her when you want to You got to see her when you can You may be fighting A losing battle But you have so much fun 